All right, we are going to study chapter 35, Sensory Neurological Disorders in the Child. So we learned in obstetrics that the brain and the spinal cord are formed early in gestation. It's from a neuron tube plate, it involves into a neuronal grove, neural fold, and by the third week of gestation, um, it is fully developed. Any insult or critical event, insufficient folic acid or tetragenic exposure, infection, substance abuse, trauma during this period will result in central nervous malformation. And about a third of congenital birth defects are neurological in nature. 90% of these are neurotube defects, such as encephalopathy or spina bifida. Otitis media. So otitis media is an infection in the middle ear, and you can see right here on this picture where the middle ear is. You have the outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. So this is where it gets red and inflamed, often accompanied by infection, one of the most common childhood illnesses. The Eustachian tube, which comes right off of the middle ear, you can see it right down here, um, it is much shorter and wider in children. The nasopharyngeal uh, secretions from your nose, from the back of your throat, they're able to enter that middle ear more easily and cause um, infections. It occurs frequently in boys and children who attend daycare, those with allergies, children who are exposed to tobacco smoke, and those who use pacifiers several times, several hours during the day. It actually can raise the soft palate and change the dynamics of the station tube. So by the time that a child is about 13 months, we recommend taking them off of the pacifier, doing away with it, kind of weaning them off. Exact cause is unknown, but may be related to station tube dysfunction. Often occurs after a respiratory infection, and you can imagine all the um, extra secretions a child has after a respiratory infection. It just kind of gets backed up there. Um, the infection often causes the membranes of the station to become edematous, and usually the organism that causes it is going to be a streptococcus or um, the hip, uh, hip infection. The child may have an acute onset of ear pain marked by redness of the tympatic membrane, middle ear effusions, uh, recurrent otitis media indicates repeated infections, they have more than three in six months or four in 12, 12 months, um, we might look at placing tubes in their ears. A lot of times you'll see children pulling on their ear because of the pain. They might have diarrhea, vomiting, fever, all of those are going to be typical symptoms. Of course, recommendations for treatments. On the first occurrences, we're going to try and give them antibiotics, see if that doesn't clear it up. Like I said though, if they continue to have those infections three and six months, four and 12 months, then they will look at placing the tubes in their ear, which is called a myringotomy um, for those repeated infections. You can find some family teaching tips on page 761, uh, never propping a bottle in bed with the baby, never propping a bottle at all, always sitting the baby upright whenever they're eating, uh, avoiding triggers, passive tobacco smoke, or any kind of allergens that the, you're aware of, and then um, helping prevent your child from being around anyone who has an upper respiratory infection, which can sometimes be a little difficult. Rye syndrome is an acute encephalopathy characterized by cerebral edema and fatty de degeneration of the liver and other abdomen organisms. So we're thinking about the brain, of course, we're studying neuro, um, and so basically it can cause cerebral edema, swelling on the brain. It can also increase liver enzymes, ammonia, anytime we think of ammonia we think about confusions. PT elevated from poor liver function, it can cause them to be hypoglycemic, and it is usually developed after a viral illness such as varicella, maybe the chicken pox influenza, something like that. It's also associated with aspirin use, and that's why I put aspirin down there. Pepto-Bismol also has aspirin in it. Um, we never, ever, ever suggest treating um, any of a child's pain or anything like that with aspirin, especially if it's a viral illness. 
as you know, we have studied some cardiac diseases like rheumatic fever where we do treat um, their symptoms, their joint pain with aspirin. However, we never want to encourage aspirin use, especially if we don't know what their illness is, but especially with a viral illness. So with Fry syndrome, often you'll see that the symptoms develop three to five days after the initial illness. The child's recovering when the symptoms of severe vomiting, irritability, and lethargia and confusion developed. An immediate intervention is needed in order to um, get this child taken care of. Because mortality rates are high due to that cerebral edema and the increased intracranial pressure, um, it can also cause respiratory distress uh, and will most likely involve being in. There are different stages of Fry's syndrome. The first one is gonna be farming, vomiting and lethargia. And this is saying that neuroscience, they're still okay, they're still in check, but you want to get immediate intervention. That will um, increase your likelihood of it not involving the brain quite so much. Um, combative, stupor, inappropriate language, sluggish pupils, we realize that there must be some kind of edema going on towards the brain. With that, you also think about increased intracranial pressure, and you need to know what in increased intracranial pressure, the signs and symptoms of that would be. Irritability, restlessness, personality change, the parents just come in saying that our child just isn't behaving the way that they should or the way they usually do. A high-pitched cry, that shrill cry, ataxia, vomiting, failure to thrive, seizures, a severe headache, change in LOC, any of those are signs of increased intracranial pressure. Stage three, you have a coma, decorticate rigidity, rigidity, sluggish pupils. Stage four, coma with brainstem dysfunction, deciberate rigidity, and loss of cor coronal reflex. And then five, you have coma with seizures, loss of deep tendon reflexes, respiratory arrest, and they're just not doing well. Usually prognosis on Rye syndrome, as long as you can catch it early before severe um, cerebral edema, they have a really good prognosis. The goal, of course, is medical management, provide supportive treatment, and prevent secondary effects of that cerebral edema and metabolic injury. The nursing care focuses on monitoring the child's physical condition, providing emotional support, and teaching parents about disease prevention, not using aspirin anytime your child might have a viral infection. Check the child's respiratory, neurological status frequently, monitor the lab results, their INOs, administering fluids, electrolytes, and medications all as ordered. With hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, you are actually going to be doing a case study on it, so I won't get into um, great detail on it, but it is an imbalance between the production and the absorption of cerebral spinal fluid. Your body always is producing cerebral spinal fluid. It's being absorbed, it's being recreated. Um, however, if there is a dysfunction in that absorption process, you will have hydrocephalus. It can be congenital where they were born with it or it can be acquired, they develop it later. It involves a rapid head growth, we're measuring FOCs, uh, circumference, fetal occipital circumference, and so we're watching that go up with it. They also have very prominent scalp veins, hyperreflexemia, decreased LOC, um, all from that increased intracranial pressure. The treatment will be surgical and it will be pl a placement of a VP shunt. That VP shunt is in the brain and then it has a actual um, catheter that goes into the stomach. It's coiled up into the stomach, however, it will need to be replaced as that child grows because it can be displaced. Here's a picture of the hydrocephalus. You can see the scalp veins very prominent. Neurological um, function, neurotube defects, spina bifida, We've talked about this in OB as well, but it can occur anywhere along the spine. Sometimes it's concealed and hidden and all you see is a little tuft of hair. Maybe one of the vertebrae is missing, but you don't really notice it. Other times it can be very um, 
very obvious and they'll actually have a protrusion or a sac on their back. Meningeal scent Meningeal seal contains meninges and the cerebral spinal fluid. The myelomeningeal seal contains the meninges, the cerebral spinal fluid, and a portion of that spinal cord or nerve roots are actually going out into the sac. So you can see where this is much more detrimental than just a meningeal seal. Handicap occurs in 99% of these patients because that spinal cord is involved. Lower extremities may be completely paralyzed or have varying degrees of immobility. Of course, you think about the higher the defect is um, on the back, the greater the neurological dysfunction. And that's the same. If you have a neck injury, it's a lot worse than if you had a back injury. Sometimes bowel and bladder sphincters may be affected. Um, they could have a colostomy bag. They might even straight cap themselves through the belly button. They'll pull the bladder up to the belly button where they are able to uh, cap themselves that way. Surgery is usually performed within 24 to 48 hours after birth to reduce infection. Comprehensive care includes neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, urologists, physical therapy, and nursing care, of course. At birth, you wanna cover that step that sack with a sterile saline dressing. You want to keep it moist, but you also have to protect it from infection. You're going to be placing the infant prone with their hips flexed and their leg legs abducted to minimize any kind of tension on that sack. The lower the sack is, of course, you have to worry about it getting any kind of fecal matter into it and keeping that clean as well. And due to loss of sensation, you have to watch the extremities for pressure, for temperature um, that could cause any kind of skin breakdown or injury. A lot of times they'll have lifelong intermittent catheterization and bowel, bowel elimination procedures as well. With seizure disorders, uh, you need to think with seizures, what exactly are you looking for and what do you monitor for and what are you going to teach the parents to monitor for as well. During assessment part, during a seizure, you want to describe exactly what you see. You want to say how long it's been, time lapse, timing the seizures, the seizures, events that preceded it. Was there any kind of aura, something that they, maybe they had a smell, a taste in their mouth right before the seizure happened? And sometimes that can show us, give us a sign of a seizure coming on. Were they conscious during it? Did they have any other body movements during the seizure? With a febrile seizure, it often occurs between six months to three years, and it usually occurs in the form of a generalized seizure. Uh, it accompanies fever most often, and uh, or it commonly is associated with a high fever of 102 to 106. Sometimes they can have um, a higher threshold and uh, the seizure might be a little bit less. Nursing intervention, of course, timing the seizures, teaching the parents how and what to look for with the seizure, how to bring that temperature down. Often the treatment is going to be Tylenol. You might even have a anti-seizure medication, something like, um, like Valium. With CP, you will be doing a um, case study over it, so we're going to skip over it for now. CP it can be extremely severe, debilitating, or you might not even know that the person has it. Um, it might flare up when they get stressed, so you just never know with CP, but it can go both ways. Uh, bacterial meningitis. We have seen less bacterial meningitis now that we have the HIV vaccine. It's often seen, bacterial meningitis, often seen frequently in children from 6 to 12 months. Uh, was the most common cause of meningitis in children prior to the use of the HIV vaccine. Can occur secondary to other infections such as otitis media, sinusitis, pharyngitis, cellulitis, pneumonia, or septic arthritis, head trauma, and neurosurgical procedures. And what it is is the white blood cells accumulate and cover the brain with a perlent exudate. The brain becomes edematous and the ventricles become blocked. When those ventricles become blocked, it can impede the flow of cerebral spinal fluid causing hydrocephalus. They will be on droplet precautions and they will have IV antibiotics as well. Um, with head injuries, oftentimes the parents need to know that there will be a lot of blood. 
And so treatment for that, of course, ice pack and pressure. You also need to be observing them if they fall asleep, waking them up.